Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Creation Soapbox, part one, The Trouble with Uncle Chuck, or What is Evolution? Brought to you by your friends here at abitoforange.com. So to help the world, I have created the world's first useful and clear definition of Darwinian evolution, and it goes like this. Evolution is an unguided natural process, which increases the genetic information in an organism, creating new genes which did not previously exist. These new genes then cause an increase in physical complexity and associated behavior, both of which increase the organism's ability to survive and pass on these traits to offspring. Ah, just bask in it. So clear, so useful. You're welcome, science and the rest of the world. Why does it have to be an unguided natural process? Well, firstly, because we are trying to distinguish between what nature left to nature will do and what kind of miraculous supernatural intervention might have occurred. So we are distinguishing between creation by God, which is a series of miraculous supernatural events, and nature just left to nature. To sort of put a fine tune on it, what scientists do in the lab is no more an example of evolution than Mount Rushmore is an example of erosion. Erosion is a natural process. It is what happens when nature left to nature has lots of time to work. Well, Mount Rushmore is erosion ever going to create Mount Rushmore? No. It's going to weather away rocks. It's going to create changes over time, but it's not going to create the kind of changes that result in the faces of former U.S. presidents. Similarly, when scientists do something in the lab with cells or with DNA, they're learning about the chemical structure of the cells and the different parts of the cell. They're learning about how DNA can be switched around, how the information can be used, but they're not learning about what happens when DNA or cells are just left to themselves in nature to do what nature will do. Evolution is intended to be an unguided natural process, not a toolbox that God used in the creation story. It's meant to be an alternative to intelligent design, to divine intervention and miraculous creation. It is not meant to be a part of intelligent design and miraculous creation. So evolution is an unguided natural process which increases the genetic information in an organism, creating new genes which did not previously exist. Well, why does it have to be that? Well, because a bacteria does not have the genes it takes to make a worm. If evolution is going to explain where worms came from, it has to explain how bacteria could, over many, many generations, give rise to a worm. And the only way to do that is if somehow the bacterial DNA gained new genetic information to create new genes that it didn't already have, because bacteria don't have the genes it takes to make a worm. And so somehow those bacteria, over time, had to gain new genes that didn't previously exist, that are necessary to make a worm. Similarly, if you keep climbing up the evolutionary tree of life, a worm does not have the genes it takes to make a fish. So the worms that were the ancestors to the earliest fish had to gain new genetic information, which became the genes that make a fish a fish that worms don't have. Similarly, a fish does not have the genes it takes to make a lizard, and on and on through every step of the evolutionary tree. Each new kind takes new genes that did not exist in the previous kind. So somehow the previous kind had to get an increase in genetic information, which created new genes that didn't previously exist. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying they have to have more DNA nucleotides, just counting nucleotides. They have to have genes that didn't previously exist. A worm does not have the genes it takes to make a fish because a fish has scales and gills and eyes and worms don't have those things. So the worm ancestor for fish had to somehow gain the genes that made scales and eyes and gills and fins and the other things that it takes to make a fish a fish. To be clear, I'm also not saying that each successive kind has to have more genes. It's just that the kind of genes it takes to make that new kind be that new kind have to come into being because the previous kind didn't have it. Bacteria don't have the genes it takes to make a worm. They had to gain that. So whether or not the worm winds up with more nucleotides or more genes total is completely beside the point. It's just that the, the genes it takes to make a worm had to come into being somewhere between the bacteria and the first worm. So let's take fish turning into lizards. Let's use this as a very, very simple example of what I'm talking about. There's three different kinds of changes represented here. The green arrows are a shuffling of pre-existing information. So fish already have eyes and scales and gills and fins and all the different things that make a fish a fish. Now, if you take what a fish already has and you move it around, say, make it bigger or make it a different color or move the position of the fins or change the shape of the fins, you're going to wind up with a lot of different kinds of fish, but none of those changes will create a lizard. The blue arrow represents the things that a fish loses as it evolves into a lizard. A lizard doesn't have gills and fins. But if you just remove the genes for gills and fins, 
which will result in a loss of the structure of the gills and fins, you don't have a fish turning into a lizard, you just have a dead fish. In order to get a fish to turn into a lizard, you have to add the genes for lungs and legs so that the fish can have lungs and legs, which are the things that a lizard needs to be a lizard. So of these three kinds of changes, only one of them is an evolutionary change, the yellow arrow. You have to add the genes for lungs and legs in order to get a fish to turn into a lizard, because the green arrow represents a shuffling of things that are already there, which just makes different kinds of fish. The blue arrow represents a loss of genetic information, which just kills your fish. In order to get a fish to turn into a lizard, you have to add the genes that code for the parts that make a lizard a lizard. Therefore, there has to be an increase in genetic information that creates new genes that did not previously exist. These new genes then cause an increase in physical complexity and associated behavior. There has to be a result in terms of phenotype, physical expression of those genes, and associated behavior. So in our previous example, the genes for legs and lungs have to be expressed by actual physical lungs being made in the creature and actual legs being made outside the creature, but then also the associated behavior of walking and breathing. Genetic changes which don't cause the creation of new structures and or behaviors are not evolutionary changes. They are neutral. So take a look at our picture of the Eiffel Tower here. Between the first picture and the second picture, let's say there's been some kind of drastic change to the blueprints. That would be a change in our DNA. But between the first and second picture, nothing's been built. So that change in the blueprint has not been expressed physically, or in what we'd call the phenotype. This is not an evolutionary change, because the blueprint might carry new information, but it hasn't resulted in anything. Between the second and third pictures, now there has been a change in physical complexity, and if this weren't a building, associated behavior. That is an evolutionary change. It is some kind of physical change which is expressed physically, not just in information that doesn't do anything for the plant or animal. Both of which increase the organism's ability to survive and pass on these traits to offspring. This is key to make it an evolutionary change as well. Because if you take just your average comic book superhero, they get a blast of gamma radiation or get bit by a poisonous spider, and they personally had some kind of new powers they didn't have before. But that's not an evolutionary change unless it can be passed on to offspring. Spider-Man becoming Spider-Man is no more an evolutionary change than if you were to take an average frog and paint him a different color. Well, that's not going to affect his offspring, and so it'll affect that one individual, but unless it affects the future generations, and therefore the population, it's not an evolutionary change. So, if there is some kind of genetic change that doesn't aid in survival, or increase the number of and survival of the offspring, it's not an evolutionary change. If it doesn't get passed on to the offspring, it's not an evolutionary change. Change in an individual is not an evolutionary change unless it's a change that can be passed on to future generations, and then also help them to survive and have offspring of their own. Thanks for joining us on this bit of orange here on the Creation Soapbox. I hope you enjoyed this bit of orange. If you want more, check out a bitoforange.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, Jesus loves you.